Welcome, everybody. I'm going to get started in just about 30 seconds. So get settled. Get ready for a great session. Oh, wow. People keep coming in. This is going to be a good one. You're in the right place. Okay. So I don't want to take any time away from our distinguished guests. So I want to welcome you all to the Ohio Family Engagement Leadership Summit. Hopefully you've been able to uh, take advantage of some of the uh, learning throughout the day. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. If you've been here all day, that means a lot. Um, my name is Tom Capretta. I'm going to be the moderator for this session. So if you're having any type of issues with technology or have any questions, feel free to pass things along to me. I'll be able to help you out. Uh, you are in session number 19, which is practical tips, working with culturally diverse families. Uh, so hopefully you're in the right place. Like I said, even if you didn't need to be here, you should probably stay. This is going to be a good one. Um, to ensure you get the most out of today, I'm going to ask that everyone accept uh, the speakers turn off your webcams and microphones unless instructed to do so uh, during the um, conversation. And on Twitter, feel free to use uh, hashtag chart new territories to share your thoughts. There's pretty good conversation going on right now, so check that out if you can. Uh, but without further ado, I'm going to pass it right over to our guest from the Pacer Center, and uh, thank you for being here today. Next. Greetings, all. The, our multicultural panel is from, as you see, the Minnesota Statewide Family Engagement Center, a project of Pacer Center, and we will individually introduce ourselves. Next. Pacer Center serves children ages birth through young adults. We have over 30 projects, and the three that are highlighted is the Simon Technology Center, the National Bullying Prevention Center, and of course, Minnesota Statewide Family Engagement Center, which is the reason that we're here. Please, next. Please utilize the link that is at the top and visit our page. We are one of the 12 statewide family engagement centers funded by the US Department of Education. We work to promote and support authentic family engagement in regular education. Next. We have found that research indicates that there's no significant difference in parents' interest in their children's success based on race, ethnicity, socioeconomic class, or cultural background. Next. My name is Bonnie Jean Smith. As you can see, I have a whole list of things behind my name. And all of that is because of my children. I found out there were not high expectations. I have four young adults now, two in general ed and two in special ed. I'm a member of the Minnesota Governor's Council on Developmental Disabilities. I'm an evaluator for the Minnesota Council for Quality. Many of you might know it as a Baldridge evaluator and I'm a member of the monitoring and technical review team for the Federal Administration on Developmental Disabilities. I worked with high school students as a behavior specialist and as an educator in the early childhood system. And I was also a director at the Early Childhood Center in South Minneapolis. I'm an author of the book, How Big is the Fly? Asking the Right Questions, and a co-author of the book, Person-Centered Thinking and Planning, The Natural Rhythms of Life. Next. When you looked at me and you saw that picture, you could tell that I was a Black American or an African American, but you couldn't see that my father was a Navy CB attached to the Air Force, and he chose to raise us up in Toulouse-Rosier, France, because it was not equitable in the United States during that time. We look through at people through lens that are tinted with our life experience. When you looked at me and my photo, you didn't know all the things that I filled in to let you know. 
My father taught us that there are many different races in this world, but within every race, each family has their own culture. And I'll give you an example. There are many people who celebrate Christmas, but in our family, we celebrate love gifts all year round. We don't give each other just gifts on what the designated Christmas is, but in the African-American community, there are those who do that. There are those who do all, all types of different cultural things, and we're all different. Equity is the quality of being fair and impartial, okay? And then I'm gonna talk about diversity in African-Americans. Both my grandfathers are full-blooded natives. One is Cherokee, one is Ojibwe. But you wouldn't know that unless you had a conversation with me and you just looked at what I look like. And to talk to you about family engagement, the things that I really appreciated was when school staff started with an honest conversation. And that honest conversation was when they asked me what was important to me and my family and what was important for me and my family, what it was working in schools and when it came around to my children's education and what was not working for my children. There are so many different things to do. And I, I'd like to give you an active listening activity that you can't do here, but do it with your coworkers and do it with your family because active listening is something that we don't normally do. We don't normally do that. But when you're doing active listening, you're able to seek to understand what the family's concerns are. You're changing your mindset, okay? And it's important that you listen like you care. And then assume, assume best intentions when you're talking with the family. And it's important that you set up high expectations for each student and their family, okay? Clearly explain the support options you have, plan to measure progress, let the families know how you will, and if they understand it, the process you're using. Share meaningful dates with them and tell them how you're gonna evaluate progress for their student. So practice these skills, it's called active listening. And normally when I do that, I have you go into a breakout room and you actually practice with somebody. Like, who are you? Who is in your family? How do you stay strong and positive for yourself and children? Who helps you? How do they do it? You'll be surprised at all the different answers that you will get. And I sent Tom a couple of tools that you could use and practice with. And one of them is, how does your child learn? And I don't know if any of you understand this, but when Horace Mann was around in the 1700s, our educational system has not changed. So that's why it's kind of outdated. And we need to come up with innovative new ways to keep our children involved. So they have self-determination. And they have input in what's going on in their education. There are several countries that are doing this already. Uh, not everybody goes to college. Some of people go to trade schools because that's what they're interested in. And I think that we need to bring it up to that level and become innovative to work that way. And as an African-American, I not only work with African-Americans, but I've worked with other ethnic groups. I've worked with Russians. I've worked with all kinds of people. And always the conversation, the honest conversation is, what is important to you for your child in school? What is working for them in school and what is not working for them in school? Thank you. Next. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jesus Villasenor. I have been advocating for the educational rights of Spanish-speaking families in Minnesota for over 26 years in special ed and in regular ed. It has been said that parents of children with disabilities 
wrote the book on family engagement. If you read about how in the 1960s and 70s, parents and people with disabilities organized and marched to state capitals throughout the country, protesting and chanting that in this country, all children have the right to a free and public education, and that all means all, you will understand how important these historic events were. That led to the con congressional bipartisan historic, um, um, approval of legislation that created the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act idea. This was family engagement at its finest. It is different for the non-English speaking parents that, work, that I work with, because for them, engagement in their children's education is more uncertain and difficult to achieve. And it's often because they have lacked the necessary information to fully participate. In fact, most of the parents who call me for help don't even know what to ask for. They just know that they need help. This gives me the opportunity of setting up home visits, pre-COVID, of course, and give them the information they so desper desperately need in a far more personal way. In this type of work, not only do I have the opportunity of sharing information, but I also learn about their needs. I have learned a lot from parents these past 26 years. Next, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, yes, this is the right one. Um, one of the first things I learned from this work is that besides of the commun common denominator of language, the diversity in the Latino community is very vast. So I don't pretend to speak for all, but I am aware of the great difficulties that language and culture represent for most of the parents that I work with. When we talk about the fact that creating partnership is one of the best strategies to engage families in education, we have to do it in a way that makes sense to them because the parents that I'm talking about don't feel that they have the academic education that they need to be a partner with the teacher or the daughter or son. And they never needed in the past before coming to this country. In truth, in Latin America, the schools leave very little room for the parents to participate actively in their children's education. And the only thing that schools, public and private ones, ask from parents is to not to contradict the decision of the school for the benefit of the students. So the only thing that is left for parents to do is to make sure that their children attend school with clean clothes. And of course, they take children to school because there are no school bus services in public schools. And they make sure only that they, um, they bring them to school ready to learn. With this in mind, it's easy to imagine how the parents that, I, that have recently arrived in this country feel confused about the expectations of entering into a partnership that is so much more involved than what they have exper ever experienced before. When an embarrassed mother told me that the teacher, teacher of her daughter asked her to be her partner, she told me that she herself only went to school up to the third grade. And how could she ever pretend to be the teacher's partner? My answer was, don't be intimidated. Teachers may have licensure or a master's degree, but you have a doctorate when it comes to your child. Nobody knows her better. Remember, you are the expert on your child. Over the years, many teachers will come and go, but you'll always be at your child's side. So when it comes to building partnerships, I think it can happen at two levels. I have seen how the building at the building level, principals set the tone in making the families feel welcome. From the office staff, not always the best example of customer service, to the principal's office, to the family events. On the most successful family nights, I have seen principals welcoming people at the door Reading children and parents by their names and teachers and support staff socializing with the families, creating a great atmosphere. 
Compare that to an event where there would only be the liaison, cultural liaisons, interpreters, and janitors, and just a few families attending. After that failure, how can you convince parents to go back, especially after working long hours at their jobs? Now, at the classroom level, the best way to engage children is by acknowledging their presence in the classroom, especially the quiet and well-behaved ones. I always work harder for teachers that would make a point of connecting with me. With a wink of the eye or a tap of my, on my shoulder, they made me feel welcome and special. And that always made me feel that they had, they had high expectations for me and that I was important. I try so hard not to disappoint them. Of course, I would hardly wait to go home and tell my parents about this wonderful teacher who made me feel that I belonged in their class. And my parents, of course, were delighted. That's when I understood the saying that parents often tell the teachers, if you love my child, I will love you. When teaching children who look and sound different than you, it's very important to be aware of the inherent biases that we all have and to make sure that they feel welcome, respected, and confident that they belong in the classroom. I couldn't believe my ears when a teacher in Minnesota asked me if he had to teach illegal children. These are the circumstances under which some, some children are learning today. By the way, Please make a serious effort in learning how to pronounce a student's name correctly. It may sound unimportant, but mispronouncing their names can have such a profound effect in their self-esteem. How should I know? My name is Jesus. <laughs> no, but I, you know, I'm a grown-up. I, I don't care. But I, um, just to give you an example, there was this teacher that was complaining because this student as soon as she was um, going through the, the, the roll call, um, she knew that this kid was there, but in that moment, the kid would uh, shut, the, the, shut the, the camera off and many times just disconnect. His name was Jair, Y-A-H-I-R. Well, she kept pronouncing his name as Jir. And, and and she but she and, and you know and this, she knew that this kid was there when she was doing the goal role, but in the moment that she would say dear, um this kid would uh would close would shut down. So I I said, Well um you know you're mispronouncing his name can say ja, Jair and she would say Jahir and said no, try again. Jair, and she would say Jair, <laughs> and so uh, you know you can imagine. I mean, it's, it, it, again, it may sound unimportant, but but it is important for children. Now, for those children who struggle in class, either academically or with behavior issues, you need to know that if children could, they would. If they could learn, they would learn. Nobody wants to be scolded or humiliated or punished. They would prefer compliments to suspensions, any kid would. So don't wait until a student is, is being sent to the principal's office for the 15th time before he or she gets referred to be evaluated and get the support that they may need. There is not such a thing as a problem child. Instead, the child has a problem. I always advise parents to make a point of introducing themselves to the teachers right away at the beginning of the school year before their child may get in trouble and they may end up uh, meeting uh, each other for the first time in the principal's office. I want to make the same suggestions to you. I know that parent-teacher conferences is the usual time and place to talk about the students, but if you have noticed, there is never enough time to really have a conversation quite often the parents that are ahead of us take more time than they should, which leaves the rest of us with not enough time. Be aware that Latino parents always want to know more about the behavior of their children in their classroom than how they are doing academically. 
That is because for most Latinos, good behavior and manners are extremely important. It's a good idea to introduce yourself to the parents and ask what would be the best way of communicating with them. Parents are getting very good at testing, by the way. I know that you're always so busy, but if you invest a little time in the beginning trying to get to know the family and their particular culture, it will save you significant time in the long run. As a teacher once told me, getting to know the families and opening up a little so that they, the families get to know her made it possible to her to have a richer life. These conversations must be sincere and genuine. Make sure that you have a good interpreter. Always check for understanding and let the interpreter guide you through the cultural and linguistic pitfalls that could happen in the process of getting to know a family. In many instances, the interpreters and liaisons are seen by parents as the face of the school, but they're really ju just messengers. In the end, if you make a mistake and parents see that it was not intentional, they are always quick to forgive. Don't let your fears limit your wish to get to know the families better. Make sure that parents get a clear idea of what your expectations are regarding family engagement. Many times, teachers complain that a family is not participating enough or that maybe they are too involved. Some teachers believe that the, the, the best way to engage parents is to um, help the children, for them to help them, the children with homework. Others expect a lot of texting and emails. I remind you that it is very hard, if not impossible, for non-English speakers to help their children with homework. I tell them to wait the, the way they can help is to find a quiet place with good lightning and no distraction so that to do their homework, far away from siblings and other distractions such as the TV and phones, and of course, the soap operas. Oh, and about the teacher in Minnesota? I politely answer her question by saying, and in this country, all children have the right to a free public education. Thank you for listening. And I invite you to be the charismatic adult that can change the life of children. Thank you. Sorry, let me unmute myself. I usually forget to unmute myself. Hello, and uh, thanks for having us today. Uh, my name is Hassan Samantar, and um, can you hear me well? Okay, good, good. Thank you. I th we just had a, had a Wi-Fi issues earlier, so I was just making sure. Um, my name is Hassan Samantar. Again, just like uh, uh, these folks, I am uh, based in Minnesota. I um, been with the PACER, the organization PACER for um, a parent advocate and a trainer, uh, did a lot of community outreach specialist, and advisor to the Somali families. I work with um, our East African community, predominantly Somali families. Um, served on a several district interagency early intervention, and I still do uh, work with uh, folks from early childhood quite often. Um, I also collaborated with the state and the federal agencies in mental health and, and ASD projects particularly. Um, it's, it's what I really, uh, my passion is there. Um, I am a former member of a DHS or Department of Human Services Cultural and Ethnic Communities Leadership Council. That has a, it's a, it's a one year uh, program that is a, a Minnesota Congress mandated and um, served pr uh, probably there. Um, presently, I'm a member of a Minnesota, what they call uh, ADAM, the abbreviation, which is Autism and Developmental Disability Monitoring as a Community Advisor Capacity on the board. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a program federal and state provided and uh, to forecast uh, prevalence of autism and developmental, disalay, uh, developmental delay. That's uh, about in terms of the credibility. I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, tips in terms of a culture specific, particularly Somali. I am very familiar with 
um, Ohio, I shouldn't say Ohio, Columbus is where I go quite often. And I know we do have a, a large Somali families in, in, in Columbus. So hopefully uh, we'll try to shed some light on some of the things that you see maybe um, in schools and maybe give you, leave you with some tips on how to engage uh, particularly with the Somali families and how to uh, welcome them um, in, in our school districts or in our school uh, grounds. Um, to do that, I think it's a little bit um, worthwhile to talk about the background and maybe some of the um, you know, challenges you've seen in the schools, what could be the base for it, what could be the, the, the story behind it. And, 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 and here is you know, uh, some of my initial bullet points are based on that. Um, there's a difference in education system, the countries that we came from and in this country, United States. And quite often that is a very misleading to many, many of our families. We came from, and I think it's not only unique to Somalia, but a lot of other countries you will find um, the role of education is vividly defined. Um, education is solely, uh, school is responsible, solely responsible when it comes to education and, and, and anything that has something to do with the education. And um, the word that we really like and we talk about here, engagement, is something that many of our families new to us, we've never heard before, and we're not familiar with um, because it's not something we practiced. Um, schools were the government, state-run government, and uh, uh, and 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 you know, parents in ter in terms of the extent of involvement was just to get their kids ready, dress them up, and drop them off. Um, in front of the school, and that was it. As a matter of fact, engagement was not encouraged, was discouraged. Um, for a parent to, to try to engage the school um, too much, that means interfering with the system. So um, many of our families, this is a new concept to us. It's a, something that we're learning. And of course, you know, we, we all know, um, you know, data has shown us integration can take us some time, sometimes as a 10 to 15 years before, you know, parents become accustomed and, and assimilated and, 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 and integrated with, a, with our education system. Um, there's a lot of, there's a, another underlining uh, misunderstanding from our families when it comes to education system, uh, you know, besides uh, the engagement and besides only the school having um, the responsibility of educating the kids, um, many of our countries that we came from, when kids are not performing to a great level, we held them back. We held them back. Kids don't uh, progress to the next level. So that is the system that we really, it's engraved on us and many of our parents are familiar with that system. So particularly in Minnesota, I'm not quite sure how other states, I'm pretty much sure probably it's a nationally, but when kids are passing and going to the next grade, and next grade, because we do not fail, we don't hold kids back, parents' perception is, well, they must be, you know, at a, at, a, at a great level. They must be learning very well, because otherwise they wouldn't be, um, you know, um, uh, uh, proceeding to the next grade, to the second grade or third grade or fourth grade. So a lot of times, you know, in combination of the fact that our parents are not really engaged with the school um, system and the fact that the kids are, um, you know, going along with their peers, the, you know, overall perception is they are doing very well in the school, even though sometimes they may not do it, especially the new families um, that, that just moved to the country, um, um, wherever they are. Now, accommodation, uh, here's a, some of the tips that I can give you as an educator, and I'm sure it's a short period. This is a pro probably a program that we can talk for hours and hours, but I try to condense uh, some of the most important things that I see that I can give the tips to the educators or professionals in terms of, you know, reaching out to this community. Um, accommodation is, is it's a very important. Um, it's very common that um, you know, teachers were considered to be um, a family friend, um, someone that you can easily talk to. And the fact that that has severed and we're not, you know, we don't have that relationship 
with the teachers, um, a lot of parents don't know how to engage. They don't know how to engage their kids' teachers. So if you can accommodate, um, if time permits you, and I understand your, you know, many times your plate is overflowing, but um, if you can have a meeting with a teacher, uh, with a with a with a um, with the families, it could be before school, after school, maybe once a month. That goes a long way. Having that accommodation and having ha that have you know that connection with the parents um, really encourages parents to get involved more, to be part of the school community. So accommodation is very important to our families. And and if that you know if that's something you can do, if that's something you know time permits you. Now keep in keep in mind also there's a huge language barrier. And you know this technology. You know we communicate on email. We kind of communicate. It's very difficult for a lot of our parents, a lot of our families, because chances are probably they may not be able to read or write. Um, illiteracy is already high. The fact that there was, you know, civil war in the country, and there was, you know, thirty years plus that um, the, the education system has completely disintegrated. So um, that you know physical. Um, uh, contact and meeting one to one it's it's a very important and it's a very an effective way to to engage the you know families and and parents if you can um i've done a a parent to focus and lo and behold um one thing that was really a hard moment and surprise to me was uh, um parents who have a good relationship with their kids teachers seems like their students tend to do better academically. And that's not a coincidence. That's obviously, it's a, it's a data. It's a very strong data. Um, explain engagement and offer to, uh, you know, offer a way to, for, for parents to participate. Well, first of all, what is this engagement that we're talking about or involvement we're talking about? Um, again, as I said, a lot of times parents may not be educated, may not be able to help kids you know, with, with their homework. So what do I do if I come to your school? What do I do? Um, you know, what, what, what kind of responsibility are you giving me? Um, you know, what, what can I effectively do to, to, to be engaged? So if you can give something that they are, um, you know, capable of doing and, and be part of this school environment and, 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 and you know, be able to engage, it's, it's, it's effective way to engage the parents. So a lot of times when they're, not, when they're not showing up those meetings, it's not that they don't care about their kids. It's not that they, uh, you know, really don't want their kids succeed. It's just that we don't know how to engage. Um, it's not a process that we experience. It's not a process that um, we're familiar with. So if you can help the parents, I've seen a, in Minnesota, um, I'm sure every state is different, where uh, some school districts are very successful that have a higher number of, uh, of uh, students of, uh, of, of, of certain you know, ethnic groups where they have a night special for that particular families uh, where they bring the school liaisons and interpreters so they can engage those families. And it's a very successful, very successful. In turn, the kids really are engaged. Um, indicate the correlation between engagement and academic success. How are those connected? How are those connected? As an educator, as a professionals, we know that. I mean, data has shown forever that, uh, uh, you know, families, one of the indicators for kids' success is the extent that, the, you know, the parents participate, um, the kids' education or engage the schools. Well, you know, many of our families may not be aware of that, may not be aware of that engagement is a way to show that you care about. It's not only... Um, you know, the, doing the homework with the kids. It's not only doing the materials with them, but when, when the kids see that, that you really engaged as a parent, um, you know, they, they, they tend to, 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 to gravitate into that. You know, uh, kids, they don't do what we say, they do what we do. Um, and it's a very true for any, regardless of any background or any, any ethnicities. Um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, sometimes when even giving a tips to the parents, for instance, um, you know, saying to read for your child or, you know, make sure your child does the homework. 
those may not be effective with our communities. Because again, as I said, um, literacy might be low. The parents may not be able to read English or may not be able to help their kids um, in, in homework. But um, something like maybe make sure, you know, those times are the homeworks. Homework, um, there's a designated part of the house where, you know, all the TVs and electronics are off and that's the homework time. Um, it could be, you know, half an hour a day, uh, at night. It could be 20 minutes. It could be an hour. Uh, you know, things in that nature probably will be help, more helpful than, uh, than typically what we see in our mainstream, you know, read your child or, you know, make sure. Uh, you know, another thing is my homework, you know, the, the homework that I give your, your child, it shouldn't be taken more than half an hour. It shouldn't be taken more than 15 minutes. And if that child is sitting, you know, on that homework for an hour, then obviously it's a, something simple that the parents can observe and maybe communicate back to you. I think my child is having some challenges with your class because I see them sitting there and struggling, you know, and you're telling me it shouldn't be taking more than 20 minutes, something in that nature. So thinking out of the box and, you know, finding a way to reconnect uh, connect with these families. Um, and my last bullet, is a consider communication platform families already using. Um, you know, to, after this, particularly this pandemic, um, one thing that I've noticed, uh, you know, I myself as an advocate and, and reach out to families, I had to think out of the, you know, out of the box. And lo and behold, what I really found out, there are some applications that families use for their personal use. And of course, I understand there's a legality around it, some school districts may not allow certain platforms, but if you can, if you can, and I wrote WhatsApp here, WhatsApp is a very powerful, and our communities is not something that is unique to um, either Minnesota, regardless in the world where we are, we are on a WhatsApp 24 hours. So one of the ways that I deliver some of my presentations, some of the communications that I have, you know, with the parents, it's a through WhatsApp. It's a very simple, um, you know, app to use, it's free, um, you know, parents, it doesn't cost any money, and so you can call anybody in the world um, through WhatsApp if you're not familiar with. So I deliver all the message, all the content that I want to share with the parents, um, you know, one thing that was a big in our uh, state is, you know, students going back to school, what are some of the new policies the schools are, are implementing, and that's how I've been you know, it has been, I mean, if, if, if I call a Zoom, I probably would be able to reach two, three, four families. But and I know every parent of a Somali parent background, particularly, are very capable using a WhatsApp. And so when I get into WhatsApp, I can see there's a probably, you know, 30, 40 parents that are checking the, the message or maybe in tune with that. So that's another way of uh, uh, that we can think of out of the box and see if we can connect with the parents. Um, thank you very much. And I'm gonna pass on to Dao. Hello, uh, my name is Dao Shaw, and I'm, I'm a parent advocate at the PACE Center for the last 28 years. I uh, was originally from Laos as a refugee, uh, coming to this country 36 years ago. Um, I'm parents myself of seven adult children, uh, four girls, three boys, and I have a daughter with intellectual disability, and she brought me to Pacer and for many years before, and I'm and I'm working there. So uh, I serve uh, many advisory board and. Uh, uh, the board director for the cultural center uh, in uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota, as well. So, um, next. I uh, want to share with you that the diversity of Asian American community is uh, uh, based on the different ethnic background, education, social economic, uh, first, second, third, or ge uh, generation, uh, all 
like a, a new refugee uh, coming to this country or uh, the acculturation of the, the family. So Asian American is very diverse. Um, particularly in Minnesota is very diverse. Uh, I believe in Ohio too, yes, the Asian American community is very really diverse in that. I would like to touch on this uh, family school partnership. Uh, being a young parent then, it is very challenging for me to, to uh, navigate the school system. I would like to say that it is more easier to learn about the, uh, the school system uh, and it's more challenging to, to um, uh, engage the school system. Um, many of the refugee family who are here um, want their children to be successful so that they have a, a good vision, has high expectation of the children, but uh, they respect teachers' expertise, and with the notion that in, in this country, parents are first teachers, but those parents may understand that teacher is the teacher and also the parents for, for the child as well. So the different notion of that. So just be aware about that. Um, I believe that a uh, uh, teacher or principal and teacher can do uh, many things. Um, we know that teacher and principal are busy, uh, but uh, because the new refugee or many Asian American parents uh, respect teachers, if they don't hear from teachers, and that means they try is doing very well in school. So, um, Principal or teachers can uh, write a personal invitation to the family that uh, in this day, we want you to come and meet with me to talk about your child's uh, academic uh, progress. Uh, so in a personal writing are more likely to, 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 to have those parents engaged. Um, the other thing too I like to mention about the uh, relationship. Usually, um, uh, many of the Asian American parents don't rely that they can initiate a, a conversation with teachers. So uh, they are more likely to wait for the teacher to initiate some of the conversation with with uh, uh, parents. So. Um, if you don't see Asian American parents uh, in school uh, with a parent-teacher conference, or you see very few, that could be uh, some of the issue that uh, even though they see the flyer, but they are not quite sure if uh, they want to come uh, and how, uh, how the parent-teacher is going to be. Even though they have some concern, they, they may not be comfortable to express those concerns or they are not quite sure how to share their concern uh, with teachers or with, with uh, uh, school uh, staff. So encourage the family to um, encourage and support the family to share uh, the concern or they, what, what they uh, want for the for the children uh, do that so that they'll feel more comfortable to, to say that. Uh, in other words, I will say that uh, to make, uh, to create environment that parents feel that if they say something to teacher, if they say something to principal or other school staff, uh, there will be no retaliation against them. Or they will, uh, there will be nothing happen uh, to the child in school. So make sure about that. Um, the last thing I want to mention is about using the interpreter as a connection with uh, parents. Um, in my experience here in Minnesota, 
uh, parents, uh, if they had a concern or they want to know something, they usually call the uh, a school interpreter or school uh, uh, family liaison about that. So they expect that the, the interpreter or the family school license will make the decision or will talk about that issue. So uh, make sure that interpreter or family liaison communicate the message from teachers to parents. So uh, they are helping teachers and a family to communicate. Make sure about that. Uh, because oftentimes uh, uh, the concern, uh, parents' concern uh, stuck with the interpreter and particularly in the new years, uh, new school years, uh, uh, interpreter may not know uh, about their child's teachers. So um, uh, make sure that if you want to communicate uh, uh, something with the, with the family or if the family want to com communicate with teacher, make sure that uh, uh, interpreter and fam family liaison understand that they are there to help facilitate the communication. So uh, I just want to stop here so that we'll have plenty of time for question and uh, answer. Can you go, oh, okay. Thank you. Yes, hello everybody. We have uh, some time here saved for our lovely presenters to ask them anything. They all kind of shared a background of their uh, experiences in this country and uh, uh, helping uh, navigate the education system with uh, families of the backgrounds they share and others. So please uh, use this as an opportunity to ask any questions that might be stirring. And I have to say that we are very thick skin, so you can ask us anything. If you don't ask us questions, then we'll ask you questions. So we had a question just roll in here about learning English and uh, participants said, is there anything that helped any of you all adjust to the language barrier? I'm sure we all have a different path. Uh, maybe we can, um, you know, individually speak about our path to coming here and, uh, you know, being successful um, in English. And so I'll let uh, Dao and Jesus go first. And if you want to share maybe a minute or so. Well, Dao, do you want to go ahead? No, you go ahead. You already said. Okay, so um, I... <laughs> I I am 70 years old. Um, I came to Minnesota 36 winters ago. My, um, in full disclosure, my wife is from Minneapolis. Uh, she is of Irish descent. And I met her in Guadalajara, Mexico 45 years ago. And she taught me most of what I know about English. Um, I always liked uh, uh, English. I used to like the, a lot of, I was a fan of the Beatles and I would, um, I would sing the songs without knowing what they were saying. I was just doing it phonetically, but I was very attracted to all the, you know, to learn English specifically. And, um, so when we came to this, to, to, uh, to Minnesota, um, uh, I am an, an attorney in Mexico, so I couldn't work in that profession. So I was looking for any other type of job that would allow me to stay here. And um, it was a very humbling experience. I ended up working for Best Buy. I started to work in the warehouse because the only English that I knew was I spoke with my wife. So I only... I used to get very nervous when somebody else was asking me questions in English uh, because I was not accustomed. I mean, I just knew her accent. 
So um, it was a very slow beginning, and it was very um, humbling experience. Because um, from the warehouse, I started, I like, moved into stock merchandise. I mean, I, I, I had been an attorney for a long time before doing this. So, but, you know, in working with the people, uh, actually Best Buy was the one that pushed me to sales because the winter was um, coming and they were getting ready for Christmas and I just had to lose all my shyness and start working just by looking, listening to other people um, address their clients and that's how I, I started. And, and now I, I cannot shut up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, learning English is very difficult for many of the uh, adults or parents who come into this country. Uh, you know, uh, I I was in a um, in a uh, ESL class, and I found that uh, the content of of the uh, uh, instruction is was not related to uh, what I could understand. Uh, let, let me say in that word, the content of the of the the lesson that I learned is that I had to be to learn a new thing, new new not not just a language but a new thing. I I believe uh, in Minnesota I encourage. Uh, the teacher to to provide the lesson uh, that are related to uh, to those uh, adult learners uh, situation that they know they know uh, about the um, the thing but they only not know how to say it in in English so I think that would be easier for them to 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 study English on the other hand. Um, it's very, very challenging for for many of those uh, family to um, to meet the family needs. So they focus it on how to survive and how to meet the family need uh, uh, every day. So uh, their time and the focus uh, are for them. Uh, so. Uh, they may not have time to um, to to learn English, or may not have plenty of opportunity to to do that. Uh, at the same time, I just want to be aware that refugee family have a, a dramatic experience, and um, it is hard for them to concentrate themselves. Uh, oftentimes, they um, they have. Uh, uh, their life experience is was so difficult, so they can man, cannot manage themselves other than just go to work, get the money, pay for rent, and get food on the table so that uh, the children can survive on on that. So, uh, when you listen to my presentation, you know that my English is is not quite there. So, um, uh, no matter how long I am here. Uh, I, I believe that my English is going to be this way, uh, even though I'm learning every day. So um, that's what I need to say about that. Yeah. Um, well, I think um, when I first came to the United States, I, I literally, I mean, I probably knew maybe five words of English. Um, so uh, there's no magic bullet. Um, it's just the hard work and you know, put in the time. Um, I came back in early 80s and um, mid 80s, I should say, 1985. And uh, um, I lived actually in Washington, D.C., Virginia area. That's where I went to school first. And um, I, I think personally what helped me is the fact that I spoke other languages and one of them being Latin um, and, and Italian. And I think uh, once you know those languages, sometimes they can kind of... Uh, in terms of pronunciation and everything is completely, of course, different, but um, there's always correlation. And so I think that's what helped me. Um, and the fact that I was a still very young man, um, but I'll tell you of all the four languages I speak, English is the hardest one. I can guarantee you that, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, 
English is the only language that doesn't have a set of rules. You have to learn everything by itself. Whereas every other language, I'm sorry, when I say every other language, I mean like like language, like uh, you know the French or the Italian, the, the, the Spanish, the Italian, all of them. Um, it's mostly you know you you either write or pronounce what you hear. So it's all depends on your hearing. Whereas English is completely you hear one thing and you know you write something completely different. So. English has been really um, the most difficult language I learned. And even though I was born in the United States and everything, my dad had us overseas. My mother was upset because we could speak better French and German than English. And then when we came back, it was a hodgepodge. It was hard to separate all that and get the English pieces back. So I agree with everyone. Yeah. One question that we, uh, that we are always asked um, or very often is, in the, in the roles in the, the father and the mom, what would be the, the best person to get, get, you know, to contact or who's making the decisions in education or engage in, in the school? And Hassan doesn't like that question. I don't like it either because we really, even though we have some well-defined gender roles in our cultures, um, it really depends on the culture of the family. Um, because we have learned that even though we belong, you know, to a specific culture at large, every family is different. So in my case, for instance, my wife is so smart that she always makes me feel that I am the one making the decisions. Uh, but uh, but it is um, it is up to every family, and and it's, I think that in in education most likely the moms are the ones, at least in the Latino culture, the ones that are more in tune what is happening in the school and the difficulties of the children. You know, the, 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 the typical answer I usually see, and I get this question a lot, um, you know, the, the, the right person to address is the, the, the person who's sitting in front of you. You know, as simple as that. Um, there are some, of course, that will dictate, especially in our community, um, the roles of the family is completely different. Um, it has always been like that. Fathers are breadwinners and they typically may be out there and, and you know, try to provide. So it's 99.9% .9 is the mothers you will see who are involved and, um, you know, um, taking care of education and schooling and stuff like that. So chances are, majority of the time you will see mom you're not going to see dad um, but usually uh, you know every family is different um, there's no such a thing culture uh, one thing that i've learned you know over the years is there's no such a thing in american culture absolutely there's none um, you know someone from uh, the west virginia appalachian mountain uh, cannot have the same culture as uh, someone in San Francisco, and both of them are American. So there's a uniqueness in every culture. So and every family dynamic is completely different, and and you know that's the best answer that I usually give. I don't want to neglect that there was a one question somebody posted: What type of activities do you suggest to engage families in a career exploration opportunities? Um, the working in a transition and a career um, exploration, one thing that I really, really would suggest folks is please loop in. I know in this, uh, you know, in our system here in the United States, we do have an age of majority where the kids can make their own decision, but we still live in, in a system that everything, most of the things are done communal. I mean, so the parents, have a still big say on what the kids is. So if you're working in a career exploration and if it's a possible, loop, in, loop the mother in, loop the family in, because chances are those are the people who are equally influencing the kids and the students when it comes to career, expo uh, career exploration. Um, besides that, I think, uh, um, you know, whatever that child is, it's a very interested in is, but is so, put, yeah. Well, so if you use the tools that Tom will send to you, you have the student centered profile and what you can do then is have conversations with the families and it's student centered 
and it'll cover all these different nuances and you'll have it on one page. So that way you don't confuse anyone with anyone and you're working together from early childhood to transition age, you'll know what the family's plan is for that student and the student's plan because you'll have it there. And that's why it's so important to do student-centered and family-centered. Okay. For, uh, for many uh, refugee families like myself, what we know in our own country that those, uh, those individuals who have a medical degree, we call doctor, uh, or those who have high degree of uh, uh, education likely uh, work in the um, with government. So uh, parents uh, uh, want their children to do well in school. They may call. They, I, yes, I want my on you to be a doctor, to be a lawyer. They 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 know about that, but uh, they they may not quite sure. Uh, how they try can can achieve that level. So it, it's a good idea to have the counselor uh, talking to to, to to the family about about that and um, uh, explain about the um, uh, the skill or, or or the subject that the child need to study. If the family bring up that yes, I want my daughter to be to be a doctor, a medical doctor, then. Uh, uh, parents will know uh, if uh, if if they uh, their vision is there, or if they had to consider uh, another career uh, for the child, or they will uh, um, uh, give up their, their their own thought and then uh, provide a good opportunity for for the child to to explore more career uh, in this country. Okay. With, unfortunately, we will have to leave the conversation here. Uh, I do know that there were a couple more questions that came in. There were a couple questions specifically about WhatsApp uh, and how uh, that is kind of use a uh, useful tool. I wanted to dig in a little deeper to that. I'm wondering if um, you all wouldn't mind sharing uh, some of your contact information for people to reach out. Obviously, that is a to the presenters, if you could just drop that in the chat. Um, but I want to echo the superintendent's message from first thing this morning about this is a snapshot in time experience, but the conversation can continue. So the superintendent challenged us to connect with someone that you like their thinking in the chat, connect with a presenter who resonated with you or left you with further questions. Don't let what we learned here die today. So um, we have these great presenters, feel free to reach out with them for further questions and please thank them in the chat. All of our presenters today did so uh, for free, took their time to be here with us. Um, and these are uh, very uh, highly experienced and highly valuable present, uh, presenters. So thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Before we jump off here though, this is unfortunately the end of the second annual Ohio Family Engagement Leadership Summit. It will help us a lot for you to take uh, the survey uh, here. Uh, this is helpful for presenters. It's helpful for us planning uh, for next time. Please take the survey um, and please take everything you learned today back to wherever you work in your community and practice building strong family school community partnerships. Thanks for being here and I wish you all a great weekend. And Tom, thank you, thank you but I couldn't get my email address in there. It's B as in boy, J as in Jet Smith at pacer.org. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you. Thank you all.